Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm going to fast forward a slide. For everybody right over there, I apologize in advance. <laughs> that pillar is really going to mess you up. Um, if you want to slide over, a lot of the action is going to be on that slide. We're all going to be uh, looking pretty far away. So I have a presentation for you today. Predictions for 2020. Um, I just whipped this together. Actually gave me an excuse because I got I to write my predictions soon in my outlook anyway. So I'm going to go over some of the things that I think you should watch out for next year. Things that I think you can count on. Basically just give you my take on the ETF market. So got a lot to get, uh, to get through. So let's go ahead and get started here with the first one. Which is inflows will happen. Really going out on a limb there. Here's the Picasso chart. The reason I say that, no matter what happens in the market, or even regulations, I'm confident ETS will take in money. The value proposition is just so strong. We call this the Picasso chart. Oh, good, it's right here, too. Because look at the uh, inflows. The, there's ETFs, index funds, and active. Active's the blue. And you can see here that inflows happen whether the market's up, up a lot, or down, right? Look at 2008, even. So no matter what happens, this, uh, this trend is pretty much in place. In fact, if and when the market gets rough, that's where you're going to see a lot more money swing, in my opinion. I think a lot of the money in mutual funds is trapped there with capital gains. And once they can realize some losses, you're going to see a ton move in. That's what we saw last year. So I think you're going to see a ton of inflows into ETFs, irregardless of some of the uh, new competitors they have out in the market, like direct indexing, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so I, I don't see a, an end in sight uh, for the ETF flows. Now, that doesn't mean active is going anywhere. What Active has going for it is the market, right? Active's assets have increased by seven trillion over the past decade because the market's up like 250%. If you have a big base and a bull market, you're immune to anything. You could lose a lot of customers and still be big. In fact, here's a stat. This year alone, Active has taken in, or its assets have grown $1.7 trillion. That is more than ETFs have taken in in the past five years combined. That's because they have a base of 11.7 trillion, market goes up 24%. You now are at 13 trillion, even though you saw hundreds of billions of outflows. So active, as long as the market doesn't go down severely, active is in fine shape. They're going to coast along. Now, if there's a severe downturn or a bear market, you could see a triple whammy. The market returns hurt their assets. People who are sitting in the capital gains are finally free to leave. And then you're going to have that secular shift also kick in. So I call it the triple whammy. So when active managers are complaining about this Fed-driven, easy market, I wish the market would be choppy, I could do better, I tell them, do not wish for that. Just wish for it to be like this, you're in good shape, uh, no worries. Now, if you look at asset classes and ETF flows, equities are the king of the hill, but look at fixed income. Fixed income ETFs have a really bright future. They're actually leading the flows this year, although I have a bet with Todd Rosenbluth at CFRA for sushi that equity will come back. Equity is like the star player. It's like Michael Jordan. You know they're going to crush it in the fourth quarter, especially because of tax loss harvesting. I see equity finishing the year at a fixed income. We'll see. Right now, they're about $25 billion behind. And you can see commodity is still small. So largely, this is equity and fixed income. And fixed income ETFs, what I find so fascinating about them is, yes, there's the shift to passive that they're benefiting from. But I think fixed income ETFs sort of um, filled, or, or filled the, the, the gap there was a thirst to trade bonds like stocks, right? An electronic exchange for bonds. ETFs kind of filled that void. And so that is part of the reason the trading crowd loves them so much. They, their trading on a lot of fixed income ETFs is, is really high. So I think you got the traders, and then you'll see some of the allocators come in. So fixed income ETFs have both sides of the equation, just like equities. Now, the reason I also think inflows will happen is because of allocators. We, we divide flows in BI. Bloomberg Intelligence by trader, ETFs used by traders and ETFs used by allocators. The traders use SPY, the Qs, and those flows can come in and out. They're very wild. You can see at the top there, negative 3 billion, plus 2 billion, but look at the allocators. Those are like some of the PowerShares long-term ETFs or uh, the Vanguard ETFs. Those come in rain or shine. And so that's why when there's a sell-off, I always look for the allocator flow index to see if that's feeling anything. If that's not feeling anything, I pretty much blow it off because I'm like, all right, this is the traders being you know, kind of itchy with things, trying to make quick moves. I'm not really worried about it. So the allocator flows are like a baseline. And that baseline is very, very good for making the prediction that inflows will continue to happen. By the way, while we're on the topic, we have sliced and diced ETF flows into these other proprietary indexes. 
like safe haven um, ETFs, gold, low vol treasuries, risk on, risk off. If anybody has any ideas for cool ways to slice up the flows, I'm all ears. We're trying to build out this dashboard. So just interesting ways to look at the flows. Now, another reason I think flows will happen is because investors are comfortably numb. That's the term I use. This is a chart showing mentions of the word recession in the media and this volume of SPY, SPY. You can see here the recession spiked up the most in basically since 2008. And yet nobody cared. It was a weird disconnect that you normally don't see. Now it's happening with impeachment. It happens with the word slowdown. Throw out any negative word that starts to see a ramp up and, and investors really much aren't moving. And I think the reason is, is because the Fed. I think as long as investors think the Fed has the markets back, any sell-off tends to be pretty short-lived. So until there's a real big change in the Fed's attitude, or potentially if there's a, a, a next year's election, who knows? But for the time being, I find that a lot of these um, sell-offs are short-lived. And I like to look at SPY volume. I call it the audience score of sell-offs. When there's a sell-off and the market's down 2 or 3%, and you know, Twitter's going crazy, and the headlines are wild, just look at SPY volume. If it's below 60 billion, it's probably going to be short-lived and come right back. Now, in 2018, it went above 60 billion a couple times. And that, you know, that was a rough year. So again, look at SPY volume if you want to get the real gauge for how people are feeling through all the noise. The great cost migration will continue. Also, not really much going out on a limb. This has been happening for a long time. This is a chart we call the cost obsession barometer. It's the percentage of flows into ETFs that go into products charging 20 basis points or less. It is now at its highest level of 98%. We're going to have to recalibrate it to 10 basis points soon, just so it can reach 100 again. And if you throw an index fund, it gets to 99%. Look, this is, a bit, this is the mother of all trends, right? Active passive is very nuanced, but high cost to low cost is really driving this. And the fiduciary advisor model is really behind it. And this is why I think ultimately we're going to see more asset managers become advisors. I think they see that 1% fee that advisors get and you know, they're getting ground down to nothing. I think there's going to be a lot of um, meshing of the lines between who's an asset manager and advisor simply because you can't live on three basis points forever. The big part of the flows is what I, we call the core wars. These are, these are ETFs that make up the core of your portfolio. That's where about a third of the flows go. BlackRock and Vanguard kind of started it, but then the others came in, Schwab, State Street, and Vesco. And now you're going to have JP Morgan, Goldman, Bank of New York, and there probably will be others. This is the Achilles heel also of BlackRock and Vanguard, in my opinion, because JP Morgan, Goldman are some of the biggest clients of BlackRock and Vanguard and their ETFs. Gold, uh, JP Morgan alone owns 22 billion of SPY. And now it's going to have a product that's exactly the same. So what you're probably going to have is a lot of people moving money in-house to their own core ETFs. That's probably going to be the worst news for BlackRock Vanguard. Most other issuers who have specialty products probably fine, but this is a trend we should watch out for because I think people look at it and go, you know, I can come out with a, a, a line of cheap beta ETFs for my own clients. I don't need to use those other products. So look out for this trend as well. Also look out for the cash wars. This is where the fee wars have spread also, which is how much are you getting in your cash sweep, right? Schwab's under fire right now because you know, there's zero commission, but they sweep it into something that doesn't earn maybe as much as a money market fund. Now you're going to see them go after each other on how much you're going to get in yield for where they sweep the cash. That's the next sort of, you know, uh, uh, battlefront in this war. Commission-free ETF trading, this one's done. Uh, we, we were watching the dominoes fall. It was a wild month, but now basically everything's free. Now it'll be like other platforms, like advisor platforms that are more with the wirehouses. Will they go commission-free? Uh, you know, we'll see. But this war is pretty much over. Um, people will worry about ETFs, okay? As, as much as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, you will hear people scaremonger and worry about ETFs. Here's my top 10 attacks on ETFs over the past, uh, just basically uh, over the past five years. I added two new ones this year. Worse, or no, as bad as the Salem witch trials, and like the song Hotel California, which, by the way, I know what they're saying. You can go in, but you can never leave. They messed it up. That's not the lyrics. The lyrics are, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. They think it's check in, whatever. Either way, they're talking about HYG. By the way, all these are active managers and or Jim Cramer. Uh, that's who's the, uh, 
If you pull the thread on these wild headlines like ETFs or weapons of mass destruction, you will find an active manager as the source. The, the headline should say, a, a competitor to ETF, ETFs trashes them. That's really the story. But if you write WMD and ETF in a headline, you will get Readership City. So you're going to continue to see people use those. FT just had another one with, uh, I think it was, uh, what they use? Um, uh, I forget what it was. Uh, it wasn't Time Bomb. It was Alarm, Alarm Bells. There's, a, there's basically like a cut and paste. Time Bomb, Alarm Bells, WMDs. Um, this is what happens when you disrupt the status quo. And so this will continue to happen. Largely, I think there's none of them to worry about. Largely because ETFs and index funds are still small. You look here, there. That's how much they make up of the entire equity market. The rest is households, active mutual funds, foreign investors. There's a lot of people in the market. Active is still driving the boat uh, or the car, and they're actually setting the prices. And I can prove that with a chart of GE. GE stock uh, went to hell last, uh, last year. This is the yellow line here. These are flows into ETFs that hold GE. So clearly, if the ETFs were the tail wagging the dog, this could not have happened, right? Now, is it possible that GE would have gone down to here if it wasn't for the inflow and bids through passive? Maybe. So maybe passive provides a little bit of a buffer in what would have been a worse sell-off. But obviously, you can see here that active is still in control. Now, there is a watch list. We, we have this list of uh, stocks most owned by passive. And Tanger is number one at 58%. And so we watch this. We call it the canary in the passive coal mine. You know, we just look at how it's pricing. We, I talk to the IR person a lot. She's not even aware. I mean, she's basically worried about feeding families that work at the company and making money. The reason this is Tanger is so owned is because Active hates it because it's a retail-oriented company in an era of Amazon. But Passive loves it because it's a dividend aristocrat. So it, it's just got this weird mix where it's got a lot of index ownership. Um, she did say less people show up to the roadshow now, so that was her sign that there's more passive ownership. But um, they do more ESG reporting. She says passive likes that. But otherwise, look, these companies are really just worth making money. They don't really care who owns the stock for the most part. So, uh, but we watch it. We want to just see if it's pricing OK, if anything happens. So that's that. Now, haven't been tested. ETFs have tried about 10 billion trades since they came out in 93. And there's been you know, 20, 30,000 issues, mostly on uh, August 24th. 2015. So you can see what that looks like in a bar chart. This is why I think they're immune to some of these criticisms. So if you want to just you know, use this as a sort of like uh, way to explain why the criticisms don't stick, it's because I think customers go in, have a good experience, and they kind of don't understand what the headlines are about. Now, the, the reason they're so good is also a danger. Because if, uh, if you trade too much, you're probably going to lose money. This was John Bogle's concern, and this was a study in Germany where they found that the ETF portion of the portfolio for a do-it-yourself investor did worse than the mutual fund because they traded it. So I would say that you, if you can't control yourself, there's probably a good case for a mutual fund with a back-end load uh, just so you hang in there. So I, I do think that's a legitimate concern with ETFs. Now, smart beta will be active's future. We are very bullish on smart beta. Here's why. If you look at the assets in ETFs, 23% is smart beta, give or take a couple percent. 1% is discretionary active. I tell, I tell people this all the time. The good news for active is advisors, not every advisor wants just a couple uh, uh, beta products. They want to outperform. Uh, they want to do different. The problem for discretionary active is they want it cheap, dirt cheap. They want it rules-based, and they want it tax-efficient. That's smart beta. So this is the problem. Sm smart active is alive and well. It's just called smart beta. This is a major problem, non-transparent active. I don't know if they realize that, that, big, that smart beta is already living where they think they're going to live. And to me, that's the biggest problem nobody's talking about with, uh, with that new uh, non-transparent active wrapper, although I'll talk about it in a minute. And there's also a ton of assets in all these categories. In other words, smart beta, people like all of it. It's not just like one you know, shiny object moment. Like It's getting thick, full of assets through all these categories. And then the other problem is uh, with smart beta, though, that could become a, a hurdle is it's confusing. A lot of value ETFs, who knows what they hold, how aggressive they are. So we have come up with the smart beta spectrum to kind of give you an idea of how aggressive your smart beta ETF. Some are very watered down, and some are much more pure, a lot more tracking error. So we're trying to get you to the right shelf in the aisle of the value ETF so you know, OK, here's the hardcore stuff, here's the middle of the road, and here's the watered down. 
And I think that's what's needed, and that's why we're doing it. We should have this out by the end of the year on our dashboard. Everybody likes the watered down smart beta, though, which I do think could be a potential problem, because in 2008, active mutual funds didn't do much to uh, uh, sidestep the downturn. Your watered down smart beta ETF will not either. Don't fool yourself into thinking it's going to do anything different than the market if it's got a 98% correlation and mostly owns like Apple and big, big cap names like that. You are the market. But some people like that. I think some people want watered down. I'm just saying, I think the pure guys who get no love now will shine in a sell-off. And we saw it in 2008. There was a 100% gap between the best performing value ETF and the worst, uh, 2008, 2009. Um, I, I gotta give uh, Invesco credit. RPV was the best at, I think, 98%. It was, it was just up a ton. So that kind of spec, that kind of difference, I think, will make the pure guys shine in a sell-off. Multi-factor has a bright future. Here's the number of launches, multi-factor versus single. You can see how multi-factor is really coming out. Advisors just want it easy. So I think multi-factor is going to be big. We see a bright future there. However, comparing them can be difficult. Look at how different these big multi-factor ETFs are. So we think the relationship between the issuer and the advisor is going to be more important, kind of like the way it was back with mutual funds. You just sort of trust them to do it right, because some of this stuff is very complicated. Each one of those has like 10 metrics. Um, Non-transparent active, look, it, there's, it, if they convert the mutual fund to the ETF, which some are talking they can do, I'm bullish. I think that's a win-win. The client gets a cheaper exposure, uh, the manager gets to keep their fee pretty much, and you get assets immediately. But if you're going to go into the market, it's just, uh, it's so tough. Uh, there's just not a real big market for it. I think there'll be some hits, uh, but it pro probably few and far between. I could be wrong. And I don't, I'm just speaking the truth. I don't really want to be bearish on this, but it just, the data tells me to be. Um, and fixed income smart beta, I'm a little bearish on, simply because people really love their bond managers. Um, bond ET, active mutual funds have taken in about uh, 200 billion this year. If rates go down, that's another story. I think rates falling and them getting caught holding too much credit could have them underperforming the ag, and you could see a turnaround and an opening for smart beta fixed income. But I still think this is gonna struggle. Okay, the ETF graveyard will grow. This year we hit 1,000 dead ETFs, so rest in peace, pour one out for them. This, this, the thousandth was an Invesco product, OEW, the S&P equal weight. Um, it was when they closed 19 of them at once and that was the thousandth, so anyway, shout out to that one. Um, look, it's harder and harder to, to, to make it here, and this is part of why non-transparent will struggle. Um, if you look, you're gonna, gonna see closures weighing it down, but still a lot of launches. It's just getting more Darwinistic out there. The average closure size is 30 million. It's up from 15 million, so more liberal in how they close ETFs now. They get it off the market. And I think the fee war is part of responsible. People just saw how tough it is. They're more apt to close and a little less apt to launch. So I don't think the ETF rule is gonna spark new launches. I think this is gonna offset the ETF rule, which makes it easier to launch, because it's gonna be more thoughtful to launch. And you're gonna have a lot of big issuers come in uh, next year, especially through non-transparent active. That's a list of the biggest uh, asset managers in the United States. Only half have ETFs. Look for the other half to get in. But look for the other half to be, uh, you know, to have a rude awakening. You know, I call the ETF industry the terror dome. This is what a big mutual fund company looks like on day one of their launch. And uh, here they are three years later. <laughs> after JP Morgan just went through this. They just, they're like full Mad Max now. Um, and I've seen it happen. It's, it, it's brutal. People don't realize how tough it is. They're like going from a country club to the jungle. Thematic ETFs will continue to grow. Uh, people kind of laugh at these, but they're big. Uh, they've got $50 billion in assets. And to me, a, a thematic is just another way to do active, right? Except it's something that people can understand, get in early on, a, on, a, on an area. And I think if you look, you know, uh, marijuana ETFs are a pretty big uh, category. We just think there should be a thematic capture score. How well do they capture that theme. So we look at active share to the biggest index, and we send it over to our BI analyst who covers that sector and tell them what's the revenue purity of the holdings. We combine that, and then we tell you how much, uh, the th what the thematic capture score is. We think this is very helpful, uh, but otherwise we're bullish on themes. ESG will underwhelm. I'm sorry, again, this makes me the bad guy, but look, ESG ETFs are 14 billion. Everybody's excited because they doubled this year. This is low vol. Okay, so just low vol alone is just towering over ESG. People want ESG to succeed so bad. The problem with ESG is what I call the Amazon problem. The question everybody should ask is, are you prepared to wake up in 10 years and miss the next Amazon? Because that's what happened with SUSA. 
It, doesn't, it never hold, held Amazon. This is a 10-year-old ESG ETF. And that's big reason it underperformed the market by 34%. If you're okay with that, by all means, go in. But I think that should be the test to filter out the slacktivists and people who are just being trendy versus the hardcore types. Then you won't be disappointed, but that's a, that's a big problem for ESG. And that's the same problem direct indexing has. Once you start removing stocks, you become an active manager, uh, right? And once you become an active manager, you probably are gonna struggle to beat the S&P. Are people ready for that? And I think that's probably gonna be headwinds on both those. And then finally, something will happen. Um, I bring up XIV. <laughs> Hopefully it's not as bad as XIV. Anybody here own XIV when it imploded? Okay, somebody's lying. I ask that at every event. Nobody's raised their hand yet. It's embarrassing, I know. Um, that's why we created the, B, the ETF traffic light, just to give you an, an idea of, it, of nasty surprise potential in the ETF. You know, there's a lot they cover, and there's just a lot going on, and some markets blow up, and the ETF will probably have downstream effects. So something will happen. Every couple of years, we get a teachable moment, whether it's leveraged or XIV, and something will happen. So be prepared for it. We'll all learn from it, but overall, I think we're okay. Here's the traffic light that we've made um, that's on the dashboard there. And this is where you can find me on, uh, on the terminal BI ETF. Also do a podcast called Trillions that's on iTunes and a TV show called ETF IQ. And uh, hello. And thank you. Um, I, we're not doing questions, so I'll just say, here's how you can find me on Twitter. Or if you want to uh, get on my newsletter list, I'll happy to send you uh, updates and events we do and such. So with that, I think I'm going to just end and turn over to the next speaker. Thank you very much.